velocity trace that they did, but I can't find anything like that. It's, it's like the information is being withheld, which I understand because technically the Canada arm is not retired. They just gave it a conversion. So maybe they're, you know, their information is still proprietary. <coughs> So last time um, we, I think we finished up the visualization or something at first, and then the second, um, or maybe the whole time I spent on this rolling disc, but anyways, the last thing that we did was the rolling disc, okay? And this, I brought my uh, lunch plate so I could have a visual, but um, this is just a knife edge rolling disc rolling on a should bring something that shouldn't break, I guess, for the... Um, so we're trying to model this, and we have this no slip. That's slipping, right? So that's not our model. Um, if I can make this uh, have a, a, a sharp enough edge, and, it, and um, it probably doesn't slip for small roll angles, which is this angle. And, uh, but we're modeling the system as that, and it turns out that it has two um, velocity constraints associated with the point fixed on the disk R in the end frame, the velocity has the velocity in the end frame has to be zero in the plane. Two, we got two generalized um, speeds there. I mean, sorry, two velocity constraints, and thus uh, let me open up. <clears throat> Notebook from last time was this one. Let me get back down to the bottom there. And I'm going to, I forgot to name this one. Let me name it first. Uh, 2017 1127. I'm going to make a copy of this <clears throat> for today and rename it. So this is going to be. Uh, 2901, 2901. All right, new notebook here. Um, let's get rid of some of this stuff. Make it bigger. Kernel restart, run all. And then go to the bottom. Okay. Uh, those... We had five coordinates, the X and Y position of the, of the disk, the yaw angle of the disk, the roll angle, and then the, the angle, the pitch angle that I called it. All right. So we had all those, and um, that's five. Minus the two velocity constraints gives us three equations that come from FR and FR star. FR plus FR star. So we got down to this portion here. And the important part is um, here I solved FR plus FR star for the U dots. So we have three equations. And if we want to, just to make this a little clearer, what we've got there, I could do... Um, I think I have a, do I have a U? Let's see if I have a U. U diff. All right, so that, that's this first order explicit form here. All the dots on the left-hand side, no dots on the right-hand side. And, and the key thing that I was trying to point out there at the end is um, that if I do me dot find dynamic symbols of u dots, notice this is this is this set. That's all that's in it. 
This is what? What was Q2? The rolling. the roll angle. So that's this angle. And then these are just the angular rates um, that are associated. We um, use the measure numbers of the um, body fixed motion in the in the L frame. So this is um, yaw rate, turns out to be, roll rate, and U3 is um, this uh, body fixed um, rotational rate of the uh, pitch, the pitch rate. So that's all that shows up here, okay? Um, so what this means is all of the coordinates except Q2 are ignorable. And that was that new word that I introduced last time. And ignorable just means the coordinates do not show up in the dynamic equations. So I can discover the motion, um, and it does not matter where on the table I am. Okay, so if I <clears throat> have this disk and I start it right here with some initial condition and we get it rolling, it's going to have some dynamics. And we could trace out Q2, U1, U2, all of the coordinates. If I start it right here with the same initial conditions, it's going to have the exact same dynamics, right? So the motion is the same. And, um, <clears throat> and it's I irrespective of not only the position, X and Y, but also this angle, right? The, ro the angle of the disk. I can start it at any, any angle, and it's still going to have the same dynamics. And I also can start it pointing in any direction on the table. That's my yaw angle. That doesn't show up in the equations. So if I roll it here with the same initial conditions or point it here, the motion's the same. So that's the key thing here. These drop out automatically. You can include them. But as you learn and do more problems, you'll, you can exclude them from the beginning. And it often simplifies your problem a great deal. Okay? But that's super uh, interesting there. Then we have, uh, those are our dynamics, dynamic equations of motion. Here we have Q2 dot, Q1 dot, Q2 dot, Q3 dot, X dot, and Y dot. Um, these are our kinematic differential equations. And these, we, we chose non-trivial um, generalized speeds, so we have these expressions here associated with those non-trivial generalized speeds. <clears throat> we have to integrate these equations and some of these equations to find the solution. In fact, because only Q2 shows up in here, the only equation we need is this from our kinematics. Okay, So if I take those three and this, I have a complete set. I'll know at any time step what Q2, U2, U1, U2, and U3 are. So if I put, put that up there, make it a column of four, I have the, not, the uh, minimal set of dynamic equations, um, total uh, dynamic and kinematical equations needed to find the motion of that system. Does that make sense? Questions on that? You see why um, <clears throat> it's not necessary to have any of these equations to, com to f complete the integral. If I say that x equals um, q2, u1, u2, u3, okay, and then x dot, if I want to integrate this, with respect to time. Um, all I need to ensure is that I have these four variables, q1, u1, u2, u3, in this equation, in this expression here. Is that making any sense? It's a another way 
to say that. Integrating this equate this expression with respect to time is going to give me what Q1 is, right? So if Q1 dot, if I integrate it, I get Q1. But I don't need to know what Q1 dot is to calculate any of the other integrals. But if I want to calculate U1 dot, well, I'm going to need to know U2 and U3. If I want to know U2 dot, I'm going to need to know what Q2, U1, U3 are. And then if I want that one, I need U1, U2, U3, and Q2. But, I, but it doesn't depend on me integrating any of these other equations. All right? Now, these we have in terms of the U's and the Q's. And only the dependent, I mean, sorry, only the independent use, right? Recall that Vx and Vy are the dependent speeds that we chose. And these are the expressions for Vx and Vy in terms of the independent use. So if I just put that expression here and put that expression here, I have these, I'll have a, I'll, I can integrate this and find out what x is and integrate that and find out what y is. Okay. Now, if I'm interested in what q is, what u, th q3 is, q1 and q3 is, and x and y, then I can just add those equations and integrate them along with the rest of the uh, minimal set that's necessary. Questions there? on that. Can somebody like uh, put in their words what, what, the, what the big picture is here that I'm trying to convey with these non-holonomic systems? Anybody willing to take a stab? All right, Josh. Anybody else? Other thoughts on that? I think what Josh said is correct. Anybody think what Josh says is not quite correct or needs a little more stuff? A little more? Let's, I just want to, all right, so we had Q1, Q2, Q3, X, and Y. These were our coordinates. Um, let's call them explicitly the generalized coordinates. In the minimal set we had here to describe the full configuration of the system, right? If I want to know, <clears throat> I, I want to know what angle this thing's at and where it is in space, I have to have those five coordinates. So n equals five. And then we had these velocity constraints. We had two of them, right? So m equals two. And those velocity constraints look like um, uh, zero equals, I'll say, some function uh, c. And, they, and it's a function of um, the, the q's and the u's. Right? And our u vector that we created was u1, u2, u3, vx, and vy. And this is, these are all of the U's. 
but we can solve these such that we get um, u, I think he uses ur for independent, and up in the book, U-P? us, us are dependent speeds equals um, some function, and I guess uh, I need another function name, let's call it h of the independent speeds and the q's, right? And there's two of these equations, so um, the shape or the size of us is uh, in um, R2, right? So that if it's a vector, it's, it's size 2. We have two, two equations there. And then we have the kinematic differential equations. And they rate, relate the q's to the u's, the q dots to the u's. And we can write those as q dot equals some function g of um, the q's and the u's. And this has um, n equations. Right, so those are the, those are those, right? This is that. Okay, the last piece of the puzzle is our fr plus fr star. How many equations are in fr plus fr star? R equals one to what? N. It's N if you have a holonomic system. What is it if you have a, P, a, a, a non holonomic system? N minus M, right? R equals P minus N. I'm sorry. <laughs> N minus M, which is equal to P. Okay? For our case, we got N equals 5, M equals 2. Uh, n equals 5, p equals 3. fr plus r, fr star, we're only going to get three dynamic equations. There's the three equations. But I just put them in first order form so that I could write ur equals some function. And uh, what letter do I have left? f maybe? f of, in our case, only the independent u's. So we had q and u r. Now, it turned out in this case, and that's not always the case, that all of the q's except one didn't show up in the equations. And that's a function of each dynamic system. Um, it's not related to the number of degrees of freedom or anything like that. Uh, it, it just relates to um, specific um, um, the specific problem. If I have a satellite out in space, it's moving. Well, it doesn't matter fundamentally if it's on this position relative to the Earth with, with this position relative to the Earth. It's still going to experience the same motion. And that's the same with the disk. All right, is this, is this making sense now? So this is sort of the 
the pieces of the puzzle. I have them displayed here for the non-holonomic system. And uh, the concepts right, are generalized coordinates, uh, generalized speeds, kin kinematical differential equations, um, velocity constraints, ignorable coordinates, and uh, one more thing. The dynamic equations in motion. Right? This is Q dot equals some function of the U dots. This is the U dots. Um, yeah. All right. So you gotta have all the you gotta have all these things for a non-holonomic system. And for a holonomic system, the only th you just you don't worry about that. And n equals p. Okay. So any time you're going to have to have all all those pieces of the puzzle to get the correct equations of motion. All right. <clears throat> Questions. This is this is like this bigger big picture stuff. You know, like when we. Uh, for the class is uh, getting a hold of all those pieces correctly. And if you do, your simulation should work. Your analyses of the motion, you should get realistic predictions, things like that, right? If you, if you model the system in a reasonable way. Thomas. it means that um, it doesn't cause it to move, right? So if I press on this table, it doesn't move in, in the in direction because it has no degree of freedom in that direction. So if the, if the force drops out, which it can, um, then that particular force doesn't cause that generalized speed to move, uh, to change, right? So if I had a force term right here or something, it would only call, it would cause U3 to change, but since these other two things are functions of u3, they would change too, right? Uh, but if, if the forces drop out, it means that when you take that dot product of the resultant force with the, general, with the uh, partial velocity, if they're perpendicular to each other, um, then it won't cause any motion. And we had that with your problem yesterday. I think talking about the same thing was um, whether a particular torque would uh, um, cause any motion in one an angular motion, and if it didn't, I could I could ignore the inertia about that axis and set it to zero or something. Does that answer? Other questions here? So it's good to keep in mind this list and the things that you're trying to trying to get a hold of. All right, so let's, we've got that here. I'm claiming we've got it. Let's simulate the system, okay? The first thing that I want to do is, um, like I said, I only need those three equations and this one to simulate the system. But I think we want to want to know what X and Y are, so I'm going to add them in uh, because we're, we're interested in the full, if I want to get the full configuration, at any point in time, I'm going to need to integrate the equations for x dot, y dot, q1 dot, and q3 dot also. Okay? And um, q1 dot needs u3 and q2. q3 dot equals needs those. These just need q2, though. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There's a q1 in there, too. So we're going to put them all together and make the complete set of equations. Now, how I'm going to do that, I'm going to make a new variable called x dots. And I'm going to put them in the order that I want them to be. 
First, I'm going to do the uh, Q dots. So I'm going to do let's do a, let's do a matrix here, and then from my Q dots, I just want to grab those expressions out. Um, Q1 dot diff, uh, Q dots. You can use the key Q2 dot diff. And the key Q dots Q three dot diff. All right, and then if I print it, what does that print? There's no QI. I need a Q one there. So that that's just snatching out. Do 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 right. I get the right hand side of, of Q one dot Q two three dot. Now. Um, Let's add to it, and I'll, I'm going to put a dot here, and I'm going to use a backslash so that I can continue the line, and that's how you do that in Python. I'm going to do column join is a method associated with matrices that I can add rows. It actually, it's a little confusing. Um, if I take two column vectors and I want to join them, it's going to stack them. So that's the meaning of that. So it will actually append rows that. I, I, I don't like the name of the... I think it should be called row join if you want to append rows, but uh, it's called column join. So let's create a new matrix, another matrix. And in this case, I want x dot and y dot, the right hand sides of x dot and y dot. Well, the right hand sides of x dot and y dot are right there. So I'm going to snatch those out of the depth speeds. So I'll do depth speeds um, vx diff in depth speeds vy diff. If I got all my parentheses right and I run that, oh, I'm sorry, it's not diff, it's uh, just vx and vy. All right. If I do that, that added two more rows to my right hand side, which are those pieces, which correspond to x dot and y dot. All right, now, one more set of equations. Let's add the dynamic set, the dynamic equations. And we already have those up there stored in a variable called u dots. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five kinematic differential equations. And then P equals three uh, dynamic equations. For a total of eight equations, we have to integrate simultaneously to get the full state. If I, um, just to make that a little clearer, let's do um, sm.eq and then sm.matrix. Um, Q1 diff, Q2 diff, Q3 diff, X diff, Y diff, and um, U1 diff, U2 diff, U3 diff. All right. So this is just a column matrix, and then I do comma here, and then give it my x dots. And it'll just display that right in this. This is the first order form. We have all the dots on the left-hand side, no dots on the right-hand side, eight differential equations here. The right-hand side is only a function of the um, independent generalized speeds and the one non-ignorable coordinate, right? All I see is a Q2. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, these, that, that's a little untrue. These are dependent on the, the ignorable coordinates. But they're, they're not necessary equations. We could leave them out if we want, but if we want x and y, 
we get them. So there, there is a Q1 there. This now is, is ready for us to um, turn into a numerical form. Okay, basically, I want to have a numerical function that evaluates the right-hand side of these equations. And most numerical integrators take that form of the equations. And um, from scipy.integrate, we're going to use uh, the, de the, the default integrator from scipy. And let's look at its help file. Integrate a system of ordinary differential equations. That's what we have. Solve a system of ordinary differentials using this particular um, method, which we talked about last time. And it says it solves this initial value problem for stiff or non-stiff systems of first-order ODEs. We have first-order ODEs in this form. Okay, I used x, but they're using y. And I've and I've redundantly used x, which is maybe a bad idea. But anyways. The dots on the left-hand side equals some function of the current state, the current time, and maybe some other things like our mass and our uh, etc. And to integrate those, you give it a, a numerical function that evaluates the right-hand side, some initial conditions, it's an initial value problem, and a, a list of time values that you want to get that um, integrator. There's a whole bunch of other options here, um, different kind of settings, et cetera. You can get more output, blah, blah, blah. You can read all that on your own. Uh, this one is an important one. Um, for stiff systems, it's often important to know the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to all of the states. So it's the Jacobian of the right-hand side. If you formulate that and pass it in, um, when things... Uh, if you have a stiff system and things are moving along and it hits a wall and, and then the state has a rapid change, it's nice to know the derivative there of that curve so that it can help the integrator do the right thing. We're, we won't do that today, but it's often, a, if you have a very stiff system, uh, maybe for your project, you might want to formulate that and pop that in there. It could help. And maybe that thing, the one that I did last time where it had had some rattling in it, um, that would have helped. Okay, and it, and it would reduce, okay, that, that's enough there. But we've got this integrator. We need to write this function. Um, pi di, <clears throat> behind the scenes, when we call system, uses this thing, essentially. Uh, there's a nice convenience function and what this does, it generates a numerical function which can evaluate the right-hand side of the first order in any difference equations from a system described by one of the following symbolic forms. We have the first form right now. x dot equals some function of x, t, and then these things are specified inputs, right? So if I have um, some input to my system that happen like a specified torque or a specified force or a specified position. And then P stands for the parameters, and those are the masses, all the constant things, the inertial scale, the inertia scalars, etc. And, and it's explained here what those are. And, and then it tells you, well, what the arguments are. Well, we pass in a n by 1 senpai matrix here, and that's not the same n that I have written here. That's just however long you want it. It needs to be. You give it the coordinates. Okay, These need to be in the same order as your equation. So our coordinates are going to be q1, q2, q3, x, and y. You give it the speeds, u1, u2, u3. You give it the constants, m, g, and r for our, our problem. And that's it. So let's do that. And I'll probably forget that, so let's, I'm going to leave it open. I'm going to do eval x dot. I'm going to na name whatever it returns. It's going to be a function. And I'm going to do generate ODE function. I'm going to give it the right-hand side. And that 
was our SymPy matrix we named X dots. The coordinates, Q1, actually I may have, uh, do, I, do we have a Q and a U already? Q is not defined, so Q1, Q2, Q3, e, uh, X, and Y. Those are our coordinates in the same order that we have here. That's critical that you put them in the same order. And then um, our speeds, and it's also important, <clears throat> by default, this generate ODU function assumes that you put the coordinates before the speeds. So always the coordinates before the speeds. You can put them in any order. I can do x, y, q2, q3, q1, but the speeds are going to be second. So keep that in mind. So let's give it the speeds now, u1, u2, u3. And the last thing were the constants, m, r, g, whatever order you want there. If I call that, and then I, it gave me something. Well, let's look, let's check its type. It's a function, nice. It also automatically generates a, a help string here. So it says, it returns the derivatives of the states, numerically evaluates the right-hand side of the first order differential equation. x dot equals x, t, and p. It knows that we didn't have any specifieds in our equation because we didn't pass any in. So it only has parameters. The first thing, you have to give it a, an, a NumPy array of eight long that correspond to the states in that order. You got to give it the current time. So a float, single value of time. And it, this can be two, one of two things. You can either have a dictionary that maps the symbolic value to a numeric value for mass, 1 kg or something, or you can put them all in an array, uh, in one array in that order. Okay, so the order matters. So let's do that. And we should be able to um, use this function. So import. Let's get some arrays in here now, and uh, let's just do x test equals, I'll do, there's a random module, and then there's a random function in there, and that's a little long to type, but if I say, give me eight random numbers, then x test is a array of length eight with some random values in it. And then I need, um, for the parameters, uh, we'll just say np.array, uh, 1 kg, radius of 1, 9.81 is g. Okay? So if I do eval x dot, and then I give it, the first argument was x test. The second was a float, so maybe it's at 2.6 seconds. Just pick a random value, and then the p test, a second array, bam. That calculated the derivatives of the state states given the current state, the current time, current value, and the current in the in the parameters. So we have a numeric function that evaluates the right hand side. That, that we derived. Um, if you plugged in num if you plugged in those same numbers into the symbolic with like subs, you get the same answer, right? But this uh, has some speed ups to it. It generates a more a, a very efficient um, function there. So, for example, if I copy that and check out the time it. That's a nice little convenient IPython function that will time things. It takes 110 microseconds to evaluate that one time, and it just evaluated it 10,000 times. So sometimes when you integrate the equations, you may need you might need to evaluate it 10,000 times. It's very common. It could be um, 100,000 times, depending on what you're simulating, or, or even more. So you want this function to run fast. 
I'm going to show you one more uh, nice feature here. If you're on the bicycle server, this will work. If you are not, um, <clears throat> it may not work because uh, you would need to install. If you have it on your own Windows computer, you would need to install this other dependency called Cython. And what Cython does is it uh, generates C code from Python code, basically. And it compiles it. And I can get things to run even faster. And this becomes very important when your equation of motion are very large. Okay, so PyDite does this automatically. Um, if you're on the server, it'll work. If you're not, it may error. So if I add generator Cython here to the end of that, and I'll call this now, um, I'll add C to it. This is, instead of a Python version, this, this is only executing Python code. This is going to execute C code behind the scenes. So if I run that, it'll generate the function. And then if I time it, That's the same. <laughs> uh, when I did that earlier today, it was uh, about a 10 times different. So what do we do here? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. So hopefully now this will tell me. There we go. Signific significantly faster. And the reason is when I call this function, it takes the Python code, it com generates C code, and compiles it on the fly. And then, bam, I get instant speed up. And you may find that helpful. And if you have trouble getting Cyclone installed on Windows, which sometimes is a pain, I can help you with that, too, in office hours. So we have this function that works now. Let's use it. Let's integrate the equations. And first, let's, give it, let's create times. Let's go for 0 to 5 seconds. And let's just, let's just give it a big number, reason 1,000. I want values at 1,000 different instances. And then we need some initial conditions, x0. I'll do np.array. Um, we'll give it an initial um, uh, yaw angle of 0, initial uh, roll angle. Let's do np.degree radian 1 degree. So let's have it leaning over 1 degree. And then initial um, rotation angle, 0. Initial position, x0, y0. Um, U1 is the yaw rate. Let's just initial 0. U2 is the roll rate, initial 0. And then U3, that's the um, uh, pitch rate, how fast this thing is going. Let's make that a number. And let's, give it a, let's give it some speed here. Let's do NP. Remember, they have to be in radians, so that's why I'm using this quick conversion. I like to think in degrees, or, or that's the way I'm programmed to think. Let's go 100 degrees per second there. Initial conditions. And then spell this as degree 2 radian. Initial conditions. We got some time values. We get the trajectory now by integrating the equations. Well, we have the function eval x dot. Um, and then we give it the initial conditions and the times. And we're going to have to give it one more thing. Um, because our function has extra arguments, and those extra arguments are the p vowels, right, this third argument. If you read the documentation of ODNT, you have to pass them in as a tuple, tuple here. So we'll have the p vowels will stay constant for every call. So I'll... I gave it a p-test up there, call it p-test. You've got to put a comma behind that to ensure this is a tuple. And in fact, to be more explicit, if I did tuple, this is just a detail of the, the call signature of that function. But um, you might have more than one arg here, and it expects to get a, a list of the extra arguments. We only have one, so I have to have it in a tuple. If I call that, I get a type error because lambda takes three position arguments, but five were given. Uh, 
Why is that? Maybe maybe this wasn't right. Oh, so I did something wrong there with a tuple. Oh, I know what I did. Use this. If you only have one extra argument in your eval x dot, this will automatically put it in a tuple. And I just, to prove that to you, if I do a p test, I just get the array. But if I do p test, comma, see how it's got those extra parentheses? It's a tuple with one thing in it. It's a detail, um, but we have a trajectory. Let's plot it. Ah. Don't f when you're on the server, it crashes your crash is the damn thing if you don't put notebook. I got to restart and run all, sorry. So questions here, what we've done while that runs. Don't be shy. So the, the ODE int is, is simply doing the initial value problem. Numerically integrates that. And these are, these are vectors. So we give it some initial conditions. And, and the, you know, the way to think about what it's doing is um, <clears throat> if I know what um, Q1 dot is, is a function of time. That's what we've figured out. You know, that, that might be that function, for example. And uh, if I uh, give it an initial condition, I can walk through here, calculate the area under the curve. There's my integral. I'm not going to get into a lot of details of that, um, but that's the gist. Okay, what does this look like? This is what we've been after the whole time. Okay, should have a trajectory in just a second. And um, first thing I'm going to do is uh, let's do that same kind of plot we did before. I'll do um, fig comma axes for equals plt dot subplots. Eight, right? We had eight different thing, eight different um, states there, and then uh, four i comma a x in enumerate axes um, a x dot plot times versus traj all rows ith column a x dot uh, set y label, um, and I need I'm going to create a variable here called states x, y, I'm sorry, q1, q2, q3, x, y, u1, u2, u3 to get the symbols. And then I'm going to put the label as, um, let's do LaTeX here so it prints nicely of the ith state in that list. Mode equals inline to make sure it puts the dollar signs around it. And I think that'll do it. I got one more thing. Uh, plt.tight layout. This is a nice little convenience function that will make sure labels don't overlap things. All right, we got something here. Remember um, the units for each one. Q1 is in meters. I'm sorry, Q1, Q2, and Q3, those are all in radians. And then these are in meters. 
These are in uh, radians per second. So it does something. Um, X and Y change, so it, it must be moving around. Um, our roll angle, Q2, starts at zero, and then it comes over to what? Um, uh, I might fall over, right? Up to 90 degrees, I think. We could t turn those into degrees if we want. Another nice thing is you could plot X versus Y. That is, um, x is the third indice, y is the fourth. Ah. So the disk starts um, this one, right? Yeah. That's zero right here. And it does that. Yeah. So this is looking at the at the table. This is one and a quarter meter. So my disc though was a radius of one meter. Pretty big disc. Disc is this big. Uh, I could make it the same as the plate. And the mass was a kilogram. So if I push that, it it does this thing. Let's simulate it a, a little bit longer. Go um, up to times, and let's do. 20 seconds, and then just execute all those cells again. There we go. <clears throat> so now it starts at zero, and it does these, these interesting patterns, right? All the while uh, that... Um, Q2 goes from 0 to 0 0.5. Oh, that's only 0.5, so not a lot. Q2 is, uh, so it's doing this thing, and it rolls in, but then it rolls back up. All right, so the roll rate, the roll angle is doing this while it's rolling around. Okay, and it corresponds to that funny little loop. So the roll angle drops. So this is a this is a conservative system. Um, if you look at U3, that's that's this rate. It changes. It's not constant. So if I give it an initial velocity, uh, it slows down, and some of that energy gets transferred into the la the longitude. I'm sorry, the lateral motions of this thing, the yawing and the uh, right. All right, that's basically where I wanted to get here. I, I, was, I thought I had a, um, I may be able to show you, I didn't quite get that done. I was going to show you the, uh, uh, I get so many, so many things open. Here's it is, prep. Blah, 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 blah. That's not it. Is it? Where is it? Huh. I do have a 3D animation of it somewhere. But I wasn't sure it was quite working. Where the heck did it go? My desktop. Wait, I was working on it right as right at the beginning of class. Where did it go? Uh, hmm. 
open this. Ah. Well, maybe maybe I can find it in the break. Let's take a break. All right. So what we did there is um, <clears throat> we got our F e fr equals over star. We formed this complete set of the kinematical and dynamical differential equa equations symbolically. We then used this generate ODE function to convert that to a efficient numerical function, which is helpful when we integrate. And then we learned about ODE int, which is a, integ a integration routine, numerical integration routine um, that we use to simulate this disk rolling around. And if I can find my 3D animation after the break, maybe I'll show you the, the disk rolling around. <laughs> but um, it's a non-conservative system. It has this knife edge rolling constraint. I'm sorry, not, it is a conservative system. Um, it doesn't lose any energy. And then it does the, potentially does some very interesting dynamics there. And uh, you can get all kinds of patterns. And um, it also uh, turns out it, it can be stable. Too. Like if I were to perturb it, it would wobble, but not necessarily fall down. And um, I didn't, I didn't pre prepare that sort of style demo, but um, here it's it's not falling down. Um, it uh, keeps looping back and forth and doing this little, little thing. Questions on on that on all that. So there was only one body here, but that was that had like all the pieces of the puzzle for a non-holonomic system. The only thing that more bodies would add is more terms in your FR and FR star, more coordinates. You know, all that stuff just increases, and you got to keep track of it. But uh, this is sort of a one of the simplest, <sighs> almost <laughs> one of the simplest. Uh, non-holonomic systems that you can can you can do. All right. I guess that's not a not a great thing to say because <laughs> it means there's a lot of harder ones. But okay. Five minutes. Uh, we'll start back at two two hours. We're working with it, but uh, got it on the desktop here and then uh, activity. All right, let's see if this works. <clears throat> it was a pretty simple uh, visualization, hopefully. See how it takes a while to run all these cells in the notebook. <clears throat> One thing to note is if you put these in a script and it's not trying to render all the mathematics and all that kind of stuff, it goes it's pretty fast. So you can create these systems quite fast. We got something. Do we have a disk? We've got a disk. All right, let's see if this thing works. <laughs> so that's what it does. It's not uh I think it's not getting the, it's not getting the x coordinates correct. R O I build this correctly.
O. Is it, did I use N-O or O? X, Y, Z. Hmm, what's wrong? What's wrong here? It, it, is, mo it is moving some. I think it's just goofy. It's so big. Let's, let's make the radius of the disk smaller. Wherever we gave it the values. P, P, I call it P-vals up here. So let's say a one kilogram, but now let's do uh, two tenths of a meter. We still get something interesting. Should roll a little faster and further. Oh yeah, and and, and notice this. Um, well, there we go. It's something. I didn't do that, but if you time how much the integration takes with the C the uh, C version or not, right? You can get speed ups here. And um, for long integrations, you know, sometimes it may take an hour to simulate a system. The human body type of models that I work with take sometimes it could take an hour to simulate some full motion, even with the, everything as fast as you can possibly get it. You know, so <clears throat> these things start to matter big time when that's a that's a four times difference if it takes. An hour with that one, it's only going to take 25 minutes with this. So, and then when you do optimization, sometimes you have to simulate, have to run that thousands and thousands of times. If every one takes an hour, and I got a cluster of computers, you want to you want to pull these things down to a manageable time. You'd like to at least go to sleep and wake up in the morning to look at your solution, right? That's like the ideal um, iteration. You can run the thing at night and do it. But sometimes when you want to solve really hard problems, you know, you might run it for weeks. Um, but it's it's better to get these things fast often. All right, so do we get anything worth watching now that makes a little more sense? Something is something's not quite right. I feel like it's not translating the X. Oh, you know... One thing is that it is R, R in X. What is, what, is mess, what is the detail here? Say it again. Oh, yeah. I should uh, set it to the same value. What did I set it? Point 0.2? Seems like it should be rolling faster. I mean, it's doing something there. Maybe it's just mo moving at a, quite a slow frame rate. Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll work on that and I'll post it. You guys can play with it too, but. Something's, I don't want to, I want to move into the next topic. Uh, all right. So there's a whole number system. I'll post that notebook. You guys have a sort of a copy too. Um, so what I want to do now is um, I'm going to start with a few slides. This is a talk I gave a couple of conferences two years ago when I was still doing research a lot. And um, I haven't made a huge amount of progress since I've been in this position because I teach so much, but um, still dabbling with it. Uh, optimal control and parameter identification of dynamical systems with direct co-location. Okay, and um, this is stuff that I worked on in my postdoc. 
And so we'll talk about some of the like the research stuff that I've been that I worked on. This is a company called Parker Hannifin, and they basically are commercializing one of these exoskeletons. You may have seen some of that on TV now. Um, there's a few companies that are getting these to uh, one one from an Israeli company just got FDA approval in the United States, and this guy has uh, is paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and I don't have a video right now, but I could show it later um, of, that he can he can walk with these crutches with this exoskeleton. <coughs> this was developed at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, and um, they hired the PhD student that, that developed it uh, at, at Parker Hannifin Corp. and are getting into motion control. And then they gave a million dollar endowment for the lab that we started at Cleveland, um, and we had all these cool fun. Toys, and this is not easy to see, but this is a treadmill visualization person with markers all over him. Um, it has force plates in the treadmill, full motion caption system, all these cool toys to measure people. So what I worked on was these controllers, first of all, they, um, it doesn't move very in a natural gait at all. Um, they're very robotic. And secondly, you got to use the crutches. So... It would be amazing if somebody doesn't have to use crutches and can walk, right, that is paralyzed. So that's the big problem we're trying to solve. The first one was, can we make these have a more natural gait? And that means making the controller for those. Well, um, the idea that uh, I worked on, and um, still am, is uh, that if I put people on this treadmill, shake them around while they walk, make them walk for hours on end, collect gobs of data, of them getting shook, shook around um, with random perturbations that maybe that data contains within it uh, ev you know, the control mechanisms that that person uses to um, balance while walking when they're being perturbed. Uh, and, it, and it does contain that, but extracting a working controller that can then be, go into the robot is non-trivial. So, I got all the data. Um, I've, worked, I've got a couple methods of getting the controller, uh, but I still haven't plug, plugged it in the controller, and that's like ne the, the next step. Pretty close on those, but one of the one of the parts of the puzzle here um, is doing um, what's called trajectory optimization. So if you have a specified input that's unknown, right? Say um, some of you have arms that you're trying to move in your simulations. Well, you want to know well what torque. Should I move? Should I apply to that joint such that it moves in a certain way? Well, if you put this in an optimal control framework, you, you're going to ask questions like, "Well, maybe I want the arm to pitch a baseball." Well, the objective may be that when the ball leaves the hand, it has a maximum velocity. So that is a a specific numerical um, or, or thing that we can try to maximize. Um, you may also want to minimize things. Maybe I want to make a robot walk that has minimal, that uses minimal amount of energy. You guys have seen, have you seen the latest Boston Dynamics video with the backflip? Who has not seen that? Who has not seen the backflip? All right, we've got to show the backflip. Um, This is Atlas, bam, doing a backflip. Unbelievable, look how natural it looks. So Boston Dynamics keeps all of their stuff secret, unfortunately. They are about 10 years ahead of the academic community in terms of robotics. And um, at the robotics conferences that I go to, we sit around and say, how the hell do they do this every time a new video comes out and try to catch up to them? And um, in, in fact, I, yeah, I watched a panel once with all the leading academic roboticists in asking that same question. And these guys, unfortunately, uh, keep it all under lock and cover, and, 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 and we're not at that level. But Atlas is pretty badass right now. And uh, this is, you know, I don't know, fifth, fourth or fifth generation probably of Atlas. But um, this is uh, insanely impressive. And notice it's not tethered anymore either. The energy that these things use, I don't know if you've seen most of the robots, they have big gasoline engines on them because the energy density content 
as in, in, fu in fuels like that, carbon, um, are, are, are the best that we've got, right? Our battery technology sucks compared to energy density com in, in uh, these things. So it takes a lot of energy to move these. They use hydraulics um, and uh, really amazing actuators in these things, and uh, they consume a lot of energy. Most of their early things were tethered, but then they've now showed these. That, that, that's electric, which is phenomenal. So they're making huge leaps and bounds in that direction, too, and getting the energy uh, use. But that, the length of that video, actually one backflip might have consumed this whole battery or something. That, that's probably the, re the reality. Um, so they, they still suck up energy. So you might want to, what, what voltage do I apply from a motor to make it walk or do a backflip with the minimal amount of energy? Okay. <clears throat> That's another optimization problem. Here's, so we, we've asked these same kind of minimal energy things, like if I want to make a simulation, if I want to make a robot or a simulation walk and make it walk uh, human-like, well, it turns out that if you look at um, all kinds of uh, creatures in, in the animal world and in, in, in humans and everything, that um, there is evidence that we locomote, locomote or ambulate um, with an inherent uh, minimal energy cost in mind. If you think about evolutionarily speaking, we want to get to our food and we have to move to get there. Um, there's, there's an evolutionary reason for us to not use a lot of energy trying to get our food. So if you formulate optim optimal c control problems around the human and say, um, walk at this speed, right? try to maintain a speed, try to stay upright, um, you don't even have to say that. Just walk at this speed, move, move from A to B, um, but do it in a minimal energy way under the constraints that you have to follow Newton's laws. Right? Our joints have to, you know, F equals MA has to hold as we're moving, and um, the mechanisms for the muscles, right? So there's a lot of uh, the way muscles work. Um, those are the consumers of energy when they activate. A muscle is doing work and consuming energy, um, how might you walk? walk okay? And if you formulate this uh, optimal problem um, in terms of energetics, you start to get interesting solutions. This is a 2D, 9 degree of freedom model here. It's got feet. It's got a contact model so the feet properly engage the ground like our feet do, and the forces. It can lift, lift the feet, and, um, and then it uses realistic inertial parameters for the human body. Um, and then it just assumes that our, our top is, you know, sort of fixed, okay, and we're just talking about these bottom ones. On the left here, we solve this with direct co co-location, and this was my PI's work, so I'm not claiming it, but um, these are muscle activations that are found, so it activates all these muscles in the body to make it walk on Earth 9.8 meters per second squared g, and we get, we get some kind of reasonably natural gait. And all I'm saying is move at one meter, two meters per second with minimal energy. It's all I ask the optim, optimal, all I ask of the optimal control problem. And then it says find what the muscle activations at each time have to be such that it does that. What's neat is I change one parameter in my F, FR star and F, or FR. Right? Change the gravity to that of the moon, and what does it predict? Skipping, which if you've ever watched the moonwalks, the real ones, that's sort of how the astronauts moved. Okay? So if you move, want to move at a minimal, minimal energetic cost on the moon, this optimization problem tells you you ought to skip. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's reasonable to think that the that your your brain has a model, a physics model of of yourself built into it, and a physiological model. It understands um, 
that if it sends a neuron to one place to activate a muscle, that action will happen. That if I send a neuron to move my arm in front of my face, my eyes will then sense it. It somehow has all this built in. We don't know what that is. You know, the, we have a, human, a brain center here that thinks about that problem more specifically from, uh, from a neural uh, engineering and a neural uh, physiology way. Um, the way I often treat it, though, is I don't really know what's in that black box. And uh, trying to decompose and figure out quite what that is is often uh, is, is, a, is a challenging problem in itself. But we can think about things in a, in a bit different way and, uh, and maybe make some sense. Okay, so this basically says here are the control actions to make it walk if I apply, if I activate a certain muscle. Now I don't know what it would have sensed to do that. So I'm, it's, it's an open loop control in this case. I say, what are the trajectories in time that would make it move that way? There's no closed loop in this. That's one key thing. And, and, the, and the brain is that thing that makes that closed loop in us. And um, the work that I was doing was trying to figure out what that closed loop was and make simplified models of maybe what the brain is doing when it senses things and, act, and does actions, which, which is tough. And um, one more thing I wanted to say on that. Um, forgot. Anyways, now, <clears throat> what is trajectory optimization? Here's a, here's a simple example we're going to do. Simple pendulum. These are the equations of motion. Fr equals Fr star will give me, and I put them in first order form, I get a single, single Fr over F, it's a single degree of freedom system, so I get one equation and one kinematical difference equation. Right? <clears throat> if I say, that I apply a torque here at the joint of this pendulum. And my goal is at time equals zero, it's here. And the final time, it's up. Okay, So I just want to apply a torque, get this thing to stand up. But let's do it with minimal energy cost. One way to formulate that minimal energy cost is if I take the, if I integrate the, the square of the torques, so if I think here's my torque trajectory, right? I square it, integrate under that curve. If I if that area of that curve is small, I haven't used a lot of force to torque to to make this thing happen. So this is an effectively a, a minimization of energy or effort, as I put here, and um, you try to minimize find whatever torque makes that integral minimal. We'll see. Right? It it knows that it's gonna have to abide by these laws. That law has the force of gravity in it. Um, and it's got to find T. These, these, these have to be valid. And it's got to find a T such that our objective happens here. So in terms of the optimal control problem, this is our objective function. And these are our boundary conditions. At the beginning of the simulation, it's here. End of the simulation, it's here. Right? So um, I won't go into this, but... This, this technique I show you also can let you identify parameters. So if you, in my case, I measured the motion of people walking. And if I want to know what the control system is, it potentially becomes a parameter identification problem. So I could say, well, maybe my controller has a bunch of feedback gains in it. It's got a closed loop controller, and there's some kind of transfer functions in there with all these different parameters. Well, what what parameters inside of the controller would make this model walk like a person that I measured? That's the other problem. So that was primary, this is the primary of the problem that I uh, work on. Um, and that was sort of the addendum onto my PI's work that I showed with the moonwalking. All right, I want to mention this too. So I'm going to show you trajectory optimization. A, a very common way of... Um, 
trying to optimize the same system is something called shooting. And what shooting means is that we, I just showed you how we could simulate the system, right? You could imagine picking an arbitrary, um, say for this pendulum, I pick an arbitrary torque, simulate the system, calculate the objective function, pick another arbitrary torque, simulate the system, calculate the objective function. And if I could simulate every single arbitrary torque, one of those is going to be a minimal objective. Does that make sense? So I could simulate the system forward in time with millions of different torque profiles and, and probably find one that's um, a minimal energy torque profile. That's shooting. The problem with this is, is um, like I said, some of these human simulations might take an hour. It might take a day to simulate. And if you want to do, well, I can't do every combination of torques because that's pretty much an, in, that's an infinite set. So we can't, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that can't hardly be solved. But if you use different optimization algorithms, um, things like uh, gradient descent type of methods, where um, these methods essentially look at the objective function and, and think about, well, if I move this way, am I going downhill into the, to the minimum or am, or am I going uphill? And so you calculate the, the slope of the object, objective function and there's all kinds of algorithms that make the right decision when you're at one point to try to move closer to the minimum or the maximum that you're after. Okay, another one you can do, you've probably maybe heard of evolutionary algorithms. There's a whole set of things there, um, genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms. These uh, often can be used without knowing the derivative of the objective function, and they work on more stochastic principles. Some of them work on, um, uh, there's like swarming. They act like, f like uh, flies, a swarm of flies, and will swarm to the, uh, uh, the minimum. Um, some are act uh, very much like evolutionary patterns. Uh, there's one called an island hopping uh, one that mimics trying to find the right sort of set. So there's a other set of algorithms, but all of those take a long time to simulate, simply, especially for complicated systems. And for these human body models that I do, it, 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 people have solved some things with it, but it takes like weeks of cluster time and, thing, and, um, and just, it's, just, it's just harder and you don't really get exactly what you want. So that's all we can. I didn't get to put together an example. Here, here's another quick thing, looking at a parameter ID. This is also the pendulum equations. Say if I measured a pendulum and I want to know what its g over l is, right? That's what p is. If you formulate this objective, you say, here's the measured angle minus the simulation angle with that given p value, which is our unknown. Square it, integrate. What's the? How do I minimize the difference in the measurement and the and the simulation? With p as my only value, this is a plot of the objective function. Right. Notice it has all these local minima. This is the one you want. In this case, p equals 10 was the value that um, worked out in this example, and that is a paper right there. But uh, if I, with gradient descent methods, if I st start my optimization search here, it'll go, oh, ah, I found the, I found the minimum, and it, and it won't get out of that. All right, so there's this problem of a local minima, and there are, in dynamic systems, there's local minima. You gotta deal with it. The genetic algorithms are, are, uh, have interesting properties that they don't always get caught in these as easy, because they might like try they might try some around here, but they might just throw a few over way over here and, and realize that, oh, it's not quite the local minima. But um, this is a nasty problem. That shooting, all shooting methods that are gradient descent can't solve this problem. Okay? Um, unless you pick the right guess in that big trough. This book, I think, is the best recommendation. John, uh, John Betts, he's an engineer at Boeing wrote this book and developed a lot of these trajectory optimizations with direct collocation methods um, that I'm going to show you right now. Um, 
uh, for spacecraft trajectories and, and uh, missile trajectories and things uh, back, in, uh, um, back in the day. And this is a really nice book. So if you want to like get into this and sort of get, get the, the, a good start, and, and I like, <clears throat> depends on, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I don't consider myself a theorist, uh, so that first part is, is nice. I like practical methods. And um, if you want to just solve some problems, it's, got, it, it's a good, good intro to that. All right, <clears throat> here's the formulation of this problem. This is FR plus FR star. Okay, some function of the x dots x r are the specified inputs. Okay, p again the parameters, the constants, things that are held constant, and t. We got those there. So that are those are your equations of motion. The key thing is um, I don't in the method I'm going to show you, I don't have to solve for x dot, which is nice because that's a computationally intensive problem for large in large number of bodies. And um, <clears throat> in the, in the, what we're interested in are what this equation has to hold, right? This is Newton's law. What combination of all these values in time makes that hold under extra c conditions? I think I, I didn't quite have, do I want to show this? Um, Ah, uh, that's fine. I'll just show this. So, it turns out that if you recall from your uh, numeric methods types of classes, you can integrate using a, a number of different integration methods. The trapezoidal rule, Simpson's rule, uh, Euler's method, backward Euler, midpoint rule. There's all these ways to try to integrate numerically a function. The two, I'm going to use two here. If I discretize the system. So if I got time start, time end, I divide it up into a bunch of time intervals, and I want to integrate the equations of motion in between those time integrals, I can use these different methods. And the backward Euler formulation says that <clears throat> instead of x dot, I can put the current x minus the previous x, that's the backwards part, instead of a plus, divided by that interval. It's just taking the area of a square. Right. Quite simple. So this is the backward Euler method, but it uses the previous point. And, um, and then I can plug in the x, whatever the trajectories of the inputs are, right? the torques and the forces I might apply, and then whatever parameter values, in the, and then t. So that i there means that now I have, I had f equations right, for my number of degrees of freedom. Um, I have two n equations, actually, for a whole dynamic system, all the kinematical difference equations and the dynamical. And now I added another dimension here, time. So I represents the value in time for that set of equations. Okay, so I have, I have uh, the dimension of however many equations are in F and their values in time. Okay? The midpoint rule is another one. I can um, you do the same thing, but uh, calculate from two points around uh, the point of interest, that, that particular value of time. So if I substitute these discretized forms into this equation, I then get a new problem that's a little different. Um, I want to minimize some objective, and that might be minimal energy, or maximum throw, uh, velocity, et cetera. That's this function with respect to theta. And now theta is every single state trajectory at every single discretized time point, every single input trajectory at, the discret at each discretized time point, and every constant parameter that I might want to investigate what the value might be. This could be masses, inertia, scalars, etc. So this is a big thing, right? If I have 10 degrees of freedom, I got 20 equations in F, and if I discretize over 
um, uh, a thousand time points, then I got twenty thousand unknowns. All right. So if you've solved any optimization problems before, that one I just showed you with the local minima had one unknown. That was that was the g over l parameter. This has thousands of un unknowns at this point. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is is that instead of simulating inside of J, typically to calculate J, you simulate for shooting, you find out what happened, calculate, is that a minimal or not? Is that minimal or not? Are we doing good on time? Um, here, instead of simulating, I say, let's introduce some constraints. At every single time point of interest, this equation has to hold. And this equation is Newton's law. Okay? So I say, find all these thousands of variables as long as Newton's law is valid at every point in time that I'm interested in. And these are discretized points of time. I might want to do from 0 to 10 seconds, but I have 500 discretizations or something. Okay, so now this is also big, right? It's a 2n, there's 2n equations there. And um, for every single time point. So that's also thousands. And you may have additional constraints, right? For the pendulum swing up problem, two additional constraints. One is at time equals 0, theta equals 0. Time equals, no, the final time, theta equals pi. Okay? And these um, can typically be, you can formulate them as e um, equality constraint. You can also put, um, uh, oh yeah, this is one additional constraint. I can say that, well, my torque has a maximum. It can only ever, the maximum it can produce is 20 newtons, 20 newton meters. So I could put bounds on any of these parameters. Or I could say, well, I know I'm looking for the optimal mass, and I know it has to be between 0 and 20 pounds. Or, I don't want anything above 20 pounds because it's too big for my system. You can put bounds on, on, the, on theta. Is this making sense? So we're going to look for the set of state trajectories, input trajectories, and or parameters that minimizes some cost function, minimal energy, maximum speed, as long as Newton's law holds at every discretized time point, and we stay in some bounds for the trajectories. Questions? You got a question? This equation is nonlinear, right? This is this is Newton's law. This is fr plus fr star and the kinematical difference equations. So this is a bunch of sines and cosines. There's all kinds of stuff in there depending on what your dynamical system is. So this is a huge nonlinear. Oh, you're asking this. Um, so this word, nonlinear programming, is a formal term that describes this problem. And, and it's the problem where you have a lot of cons all these cons lots of constraints in this form, basically. And, um, and, and it's a type of optimiz numerical optimization problem that can be solved. So the idea is that we formulate our continuous differential equations in terms of a nonlinear programming problem. And that's what that looks like, this description that I did. In the nonlinear, um, there's more, uh, I don't know if I have the perfect answer, but there's a little more than just the fact that this might be nonlinear for this. Okay, But it solves nonlinear problems, et cetera. So, what we do is we formulate an optimal control problem, and that's sort of like a the minimal energy and like you know this conceptual things. Formulate Newton's laws, and then transform it all into a non -pro nonlinear programming form. Once you get it into nonlinear programming form, there is a long list of um, software. Uh, there, th this is not my expertise. Like I don't know the details of how to do the numerical algorithms for the actual op constrained optimization problems. But um, there's a long list of 
mathematicians and other fo folks that create a variety of algorithms to solve this nonlinear programming problem. And it turns out that they're available in a lot of li software libraries. So um, I don't know uh, a lot beyond that um, there's a bunch of software libraries that can solve nonlinear programming, and I use them <laughs> to solve my problems. The part that I'm going to explain is the translation uh, from an optimal control, continuous dynamics, to the nonlinear program form, and then after that, optimization happens. In general, no, because the dimensionality is way beyond what we can see. Right? If you happen to have three dimensions, yeah, you can. If you have a uh, if you have an optimization function that's a function of three variables, sorry, sorry, a function of two variables, then you could make your contour plot and find the valleys and, and the you know you could visually find that minima. Beyond two variables, not happening. All right, so. I wrote a, pa a software package. It's under. Um, I got. A, I just submitted it earlier this uh, quarter to the Journal of Open Source Software, that implements this translation in a very efficient way um, from the symbolic dynamics that I've shown you to a nonlinear programming problem and solves it. It's called Opti, and and I'll use that right now, um, and it works, you know, really well with this stuff. But it um, has these features. I only got 10 more minutes. I'm not, I think showing you the uh, result. Here's the gist of the code, though. There's the pendulum system. Actually, I want to show you. That's the parameter identification one. Uh, oh, yeah. This is basically the, the first part's the same. Equations of motion that we get, right? This is fr plus fr star and the, and the kinematic equation. So if you run Kane's method, you would end up with this EOM variable. Pick some, a number of nodes that I want to discretize. So here I said I want a 1,000 time points from time whatever to time whatever. And then some kind of interval between the nodes, eight, um, <clears throat> a hundredth of a second in this case. Now, for the trajectory optimization, this is a little bit of a lie. Um, I don't quite have this implemented yet. So this is a sim SymPy integral. I would like to be able to write these out symbolically, and it automatically gets translated. Right now, you have to write the objective out numerically, and I'll show you that detail. But you set up some constraints. You say that at theta equals, at, uh, theta equals 0, at time equals 0, theta equals pi over 2 at the end time, that's, a sing that's the end time. And then I just said that omega is, is zero at the stop time and the end time, right? So it, it has to stop moving when it gets there. So those are boundary constraints. You then, from Opti, load this problem thing. You give it, this, you give it the objective function. You give it the equations of motion. You give it the state variables, number of nodes, interval, in this case, we, I say we know what uh, the, a parameter is, so I can tell known parameters or known trajectories if I want. And then you pass in these boundary constraints to what I call instant constraints. So at, at some time instance, I have some, some particular constraint to add to the system. Once you do that, <clears throat> there's a little magic. Behind the scenes, it just takes those symbolics and it creates this super efficient function that then I just call problem solve and I give it an initial guess. These are still s um, susceptible to local minima, but instead of taking hours to run, they take milliseconds. So I can try lots of additional guesses much, easily, much more easily than shooting, and that's helpful. And you can also give guesses that are partially right, and it'll usually find the right optimum. 
And it doesn't get hung up in the, in, in the local minima in the way that the shooting methods do. It's still an issue, though, but it'll return the solution. So let me just show you one. And uh, we've got five minutes left. We, we can continue this. But here, I, uh, the key thing is all I did was same kind of stuff as before, but I imp imported the pro problem from Opti. And there's a lot of magic that happens behind that, and we could talk about it more if you would like. Uh, in this, um, if you want to get it set up on your Windows computer, there's a little bit of pain because compiling the nonlinear programming software that's running the background for Windows is just not as pleasant. But if you want to get that set up, I can help you. It, this will run on the server. It's all, it's all in there. Um, so I get the symbolic equations in motion here. And um, this was some other junk that I had, so let's just skip that. So I got the symbolic equations in motion for, uh, oh, it's not connected. Restart, sorry. All right, so let's get these first. There we go, there we go, there we go. Equations of motion, right? And note, I'm, notice I have not solved for the U dots. Don't need to. That's a nice, really nice thing. Do not have to do that um, M inverse G that I showed you, which is computationally intensive. And then I'm going to skip right down here, and then I have a map, some values, right? I have an inertia. This is a compound pendulum, a mass, gravity, and a length d. Target angle at the end is going to be pi. Here, let me, I was playing around with this. Let me shorten this. Let's do it in five seconds. And <clears throat> this is the part that I still am working on. I would like to be able to write these symbolically. But here I have that the objective torque, if I, I, I get that torque value, and then I say the discrete version of this is that not instead of the integral, it's the sum of the squares of the torque times h, the interval value, has to be minimal. So basically, this is essentially the integral of the squares of the torques trajectories. I'm not going to, I'll I can explain that when I have more time. And then I have to write the objective. They're not too complicated for this problem. The next thing, I say what these, I want, at the beginning I want it to be down, and at the top I want it to be up. And then I create this problem. Um, right, I've got to execute all my cells. All right. What happens right here is it translates this problem statement I just had into the nonlinear programming problem. Bam, done. And then what's nice is it creates these super efficient functions that calculate, evaluate the equations of motion, 250 microseconds per evaluation. So that, that's solving F equals MA, basically. And the Jacobian, the derivatives of all of them. And this is a huge, for a th this is with respect to theta that I showed. Theta has thousands of terms. So this is a Thousand by thousand, I mean, or or million by million, you know, whatever. It's huge scale, and these are thousands and thousands of constraints too, potentially. It evaluates that in 355 microseconds. It's just number crunching. Yeah. Okay. One more minute here. Let me just show you. I give it initial gist, just some random values. It's trying to solve it. It's, it's doing the optimization problem right now. I have one, one other issue. It's, it doesn't show the output like it does when you run on your own computer. But uh, And actually, this runs faster on my computer than the server. Got a solution. So that, that was quite quick. Plot the trajectories here. Uh, this was screwing up. <clears throat> Let me just do, uh, why, why is that not working? Anyways, I'll just show you the animation. 
Um, and then we'll talk about it a little more next time. So <clears throat> it's applying a torque. It found out some torque to guarantee at five seconds that this thing is up and stopped. And um, yeah, we ran out of time. We'll, we'll give it a little clearer picture of what, what, what's happened here um, next time. But the gist is, is uh, super running super slow. But by the time I race the board, you'll see that the ob objective is met. <laughs> OK? <clears throat> no, it, it didn't plot the damn state trajectories. Uh, I don't know what, it was a slight issue there. Uh, I don't, it, uh, it does something like, the, if you plot the torque, the torque looks like, and I, I put a bound on the torque. It does something like that. And, if, and it found that in 10 seconds. And that's the minimum that it can possibly be. So I'll show you a cooler. I'll show you a more fancy example next time. And uh, you guys could use this if you, if you want. It's um, not required to get a good grade on your project, but uh, if you want to take it that far, it's pretty fun stuff. Can we get there? Still at 3.8. This is slow. I did. So it gets there. It stands up. We found the optimal. I'll, I'll make that clear next time. <clears throat>